Good evening, I'm so pleased to be here, I'm so excited. Um, my name is Steph, and my Twitter name is at Sniffles. I don't have 6,000 followers, so help me out. Um, <clears throat> so, we're, we're going to talk about studying the mundane today. Um, it's about looking for the interesting things in the ordinary. This, when I first saw a picture of this... <laughs> When I first saw a picture of this, I thought it was a real object, and I was terribly disappointed to find out it was a work of art. Um, now, you can apparently purchase a reproduction of this, but this is called a coffee pot for masochists, and originally by a French artist, Jacques Carolman. It was part of his work, uh, a body of work called Catalogue of Unfindable Things. Now, this is a particular famous coffee pot for all the wrong reasons. Um, designers love it. Um, it was on the cover of a book called The Design of Everyday Things. Um, Who's heard of that? Just out of curiosity. Okay, so, oh, you guys can go to sleep now. Um, <clears throat> the, Don Norman was one of the first people to talk about use, and about designing for being usable, and also, in particular, designing for pleasurable use, or, or non-pleasurable use, just emotional reaction to things. Talking about use, or studying use, is really strange, because it's like me trying to talk about a glass pane when you're looking through at the view. So, I figured the best way I can talk about this is to talk about something that's happened recently. <laughs> How many of you put your phones in your pocket? Almost everybody. Okay, so um, I'm not going to assume that most of you, given the amount of laughter, know about Bandgate, but just very quickly. So the iPhone 6 and the iPhone 6 Plus was, were released on September 19th, and just three days afterwards, people were complaining on social media about bent phones, and they were tweeting photos of their phones, something like this. Um, on September 22nd, hash, hashtag Bengate became the trending topic on Twitter. OMG. Um, and um, these folks at Unbox Therapy, they decided to show a video of the presenter, Lou, bending the phone like this. Um, that caused a lot of uproar and everything. Then, uh, the following day, there was a conspiracy saying, oh, Matt, that video was fake. Um, this is the internet these days. Um, <laughs> and so, it went on and on and on for about five days straight. Um, including the whole thing was... <laughs> including that the whole thing was overblown in the first place, so why are we talking about it? And um, Apple was saying, look, only nine people formally complained. It is not a big deal. But what actually I found interesting, despite all the sort of funny headlines and things, is the kind of attitude that we typically have to the person who uses something, the user, the consumer, the customer, whatever name you want to call it. I'm going to share with you some choice quotes. Uh, ben Gate is your fault, not Apple's. This is the name of the topic of the article. And the quote is, let's get one thing straight. The iPhone 6 Plus photo showing mild to severe use, bending, sorry, wasn't a result of normal everyday use. Um, the next one came from The Guardian, which I found rather condescending. Um, being thin makes large phones more pocketable. I'm going, huh? um, and users need to think about the stress and strain in tight pockets as they sit down, regardless of whether they carry them in the back or front pockets. This is what our media writes about. It's exciting. Um, <laughs> but probably my favorite, I'm sorry, this is the Daily Mail. Um, <laughs> Yes, I feel dirty too, Hannah. Um, for example, do not have it sideways in a pocket, as your pocket will push it against your leg, possibly causing bending. Putting it in your back pocket could also have a similar effect, so storing it in a shirt pocket or bag might be a better option. And there's a whole slew of stuff around six or on the tips on know how not to bend your iPhone 6, like something like this. Six tips to avoid iPhone 6 bending. <laughs> One, use a case. Two, avoid tight pants. Now, I, I think these were Americans, so I'm sure they meant avoid tight trousers as well. Um, <laughs> So I want to show you, so, um, so four days, um, day four, sorry, of the whole kerfuffle, Apple felt like they had to deal with this from a publicity perspective, so they invited journalists and sort of blogger sorts to a secret testing lab, and um, <clears throat> showing that they do tests. So I'm going to show you a tiny little clip. This is cut from um, Recode.net.
So I don't know what you think we're thinking about. That's like, I could be the one wearing skinny jeans and sitting on phones if they wanted to pay me for it, really. Um, but so this in particular reminded me of a very, very specific moment in the Big Bang Theory all the way back in season one. So just for your memory, for, for your recollection. Ah, uh, sure. Okay. How about this? Um, okay. Uh, there's this farmer and he has these chickens, but they won't lay any eggs. So he calls a physicist to help. The physicist then does some calculations and he says, um, I have a solution, but uh, it only works for spherical chickens in a vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I would like to think that Apple actually spent time with real human beings when they make their phones. I mean, you imagine that they would to a certain degree, um, but rather just, just lab test and simulate human behavior. I mean, for one thing, that they would have noticed that just about everybody puts their phone in the pocket, and it's the kind of human behavior that we've just gotten so accustomed to that is very, very hard to change. And, uh, well, either you're already putting phones in your pocket, or you're like me, wishing that you have pockets to put your phones into. <laughs> um, so there's a happy ending sort to this story, and it comes in the form of of um, Ian Morris in an article from Forbes.com. And he said that people were talking about it, but actually people weren't that unhappy. So the way he found out about this was he did a Twitter sentiment analysis with the help of a company called Spreadfast. And they said, you know what? Maybe the iPhone 6 is actually so good that a little bend, not a problem. But you know, this is the sort of thing, when <clears throat> you're designing a product, a technology for somebody, can you predict? Can you predict whether this is going to happen or not? And, one of the ways that we figure this out is that I could do things like have all of us in the room, like what we've got here now, and say, how do you use your phone? And ask you that question. But that wouldn't be very realistic because you only tell me the things that you remember and the things that you're conscious of, which is useful, but not entirely the whole story. Um, or I could say, let's go in the room and, well, not quite like that. Um, uh, and, uh, and see how you use something, and see, you know, what do you do with your phone when you're not talking to somebody? Do you fiddle, do you not? Um, these are legitimate research methods for what I do, and for what people like me do who are interested in human beings and weird things like where you put your phones. Um, but it's not quite enough, because real life is entirely messy. And it speaks loads to about how we construct of scientific experiments by listening to and watching what people do in real life. So if you have a little think about what you've done today when you got up to bed in the morning and how you got here this evening, and all the series of little things you've had to do to get here, and all the series of decisions that you have had to make to get here. Um, a real person's day is filled with up and downs. We all know this. I'm telling you stuff you already know, see? Um, and all the decisions, and all this affects the decisions that you make. So people like me, we hunt for evidence to predict potential scenarios before a design crime is committed. <laughs> kind of like Tom Cruise, but less sexy. Um, <laughs> there is, this is the only diagram in the whole thing, um, there is potential that there is actually a structure to what we do. We'll go from understanding things like, how do people live with phones? To, so that, that is a very specific question with phones. I mean, obviously, it can get a little more complex than that. And all the way down to, what do you do with your phone when you're not using it? Um, and so there's a whole series of iterative processes that we use, and it is actually strangely scientific. We, we use hap um, hypothesis methods to decide what the questions are, and then find ways to validate or invalidate what we think we do in design. So I'm going to give you a little very, very basic short example that good design is hypothesis and evidence driven. And this is an unfinished story. So, um, this is my husband's um, kitchen in his office. <clears throat> it's very similar to many offices with dirty sinks and things in the sink. So there is a sign at the top. It says something like, please wash your dirty dishes. Do not leave them in the sink. Um, and so what you don't know is that they are a small, there's a small team of designers in that particular office. And they started doing something like this. Um, they stuck a face up. <laughs> They stuck a face up because there is a cognitive science trick that you can do if you stick a photo, and statistically this is actually true, if you stick um, a photo up um, of someone's face looking at you, you're less likely to do wrong <laughs> because you feel like morally judged. <laughs> um, but it only worked for a week. Um, <laughs> so, so this one's particular. So th there was a, there's another new thing, new sign with a dish rack saying, please fill me up, and an arrow pointing to it. 
Um, but if you're careful and if you do my job, and I mean, I didn't get to go to this office because I would probably start off a whole different chain of experiments if that was the case. Um, but if you're like me, you go, wait a second, not all the dishes are dirty, some of them are clean, do you just need a dish rack? And as it turns out, I asked that question, and really the problem they had was they couldn't know when the dishwasher was clean or dirty, or whether it's still running, because apparently there, there is no little light indicator. Um, and so maybe that is actually a set of experiments to begin with to see how you can actually get people to change their behavior. Um, <clears throat> so, in the wise words of someone like Jan Shipchez, who's far more famous than me and who uh, has done more interesting things, if you want to understand people, you have to understand how people function in the wild, in the natural setting, in our natural settings, in a world of chaos and grey areas, a world of consequences, and a world that's constantly changing. Thank you very much.